So a lot of people, when they come to the spiritual path, are looking for a chance to put their life, their problems, in a greater, bigger picture. So all our dramas, all our problems, our crises, our relationship breakups, our uh, various turmoil and sadnesses, these things sometimes can overwhelm us, can uh, infatuate us and uh, control us. And so when we come to a spiritual practice, what we're looking for is a chance to lessen our suffering a little bit by seeing a bigger picture. It's almost like having a, an object, like a ball, quite close to your face. Sometimes that's all you can see, this kind of problem in front of you. It's very difficult to see beyond that. But sometimes if we can just take the hand further away, instantly the problem starts to become smaller. So this is a matter of perspective. It's not really uh, a solution, it's almost like just a trick, a different way of looking at a problem. And this is the kind of theme that I'll be uh, working with tonight. Uh, we'll be looking at uh, the Buddha as a Kalyanamitta, a good friend. He was the one who showed us how we can put our life into perspective using the Dharma. He was also the one who told us how our sense of self is what keeps all those problems, all those difficulties, all our turmoil uh, happening. And I'm reminded of when I've had problems, when I've had difficulties, how much they consumed me, how, how full on they were for me. But when I spoke to friends about these problems, it wasn't so important to them. It wasn't such a big deal to them. But when they had problems, when they had difficulties, it wasn't such a big problem for me. So maybe there is something to this idea of our sense of self uh, causing some of the troubles that we have in our lives. The Buddha really questioned the sense of self that we have and asked us to investigate it and encouraged us to see it as a drawback, a problem, something that was standing in the way of us seeing the truth. So he taught many techniques for us to, to look at the self. And the one that we're going to be practicing tonight in the guided meditation is the practice of the four elements or the four properties. Have any of you encountered this before? No? Yes? Some of you? Good. Last week here, we did a lovely soft and fluffy <coughs> sunshine meditation, which was just full of love and happiness. So for those people who weren't here last week, it's a shame you missed that one because you really have to buckle up for this one because it's kind of an investigation of, of death. <laughs> and so that's something to look forward to in the next few minutes. The, this, this contemplation of the four elements, the four properties, appears in several suttas. It appears probably most famously in the Satipatthana Sutta, and it appears in the uh, Maha Awada to Rahula, the greater um, exhortation to Rahula, as well as the uh, Dhatu Vibhanga Sutta, the analysis of the elements, and also the Ma Maha Hati Padoma Sutta, the simile of the elephant's footprint, the greater simile of the elephant's footprint. It all appears in different forms, but essentially we're looking at at least four properties, great properties that the Buddha identified. These are the earth property, the uh, liquid, the water property, the heat property, and the wind property. So these are the kind of four um, properties that were in vogue at the time of the Buddha. So it was a way of seeing the world. And both internal phenomena was controlled by these properties as well as external uh, phenomena as well. So if it was uh, very windy, the wind element was up. And if you were very windy, your wind element was up too. 
So it was a way of looking at the time of the Buddha, a way of understanding both ourselves and the world. For us, though, it's an opportunity to start examining our sense of self. When uh, we do this, what we're essentially doing is, is looking correctly at what we are, who we are, and putting it into perspective. So this essentially is establishing right view, sama um, ditti. So for those who know a little bit about the Eightfold Noble Path, right view is the forerunner, it's the first factor of the Eightfold Noble Path. Right view is essentially seeing the Four Noble Truths. The Four Noble Truths are that there is suffering in the world, that there is a cause to suffering, there is a cessation to the suffering, and that there is a path that leads to this cessation. So we're interested tonight in that first Noble Truth, the truth of suffering. So the Buddha says that, the core, uh, sorry, that suffering is birth, old age, sickness, death, dot, 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 dot. And essentially, he says, it can be summed up in the five khandas, pancha, upadana, khanda. So I know that this is a, an awful lot of information, especially to the people I, I know who are new to Buddhism in this room tonight. Like I said, buckle up. The reason we look at these five khandas, which are form, feeling, perception, volition, and consciousness, is because these are our view of self. These are what we mistake for our sense of self. So form is the body. Uh, the Buddha compared it to foam. Substanceless. There's, there's no substance to foam. So in the same way, our body uh, is always changing. Our hair falls out. Our bones break. Our skin flakes off. This is why the Buddha compared it to foam. It's, it's essentially substanceless. The second of the five candors is percep uh, sorry, feeling. So feeling is the three types of feeling, painful feeling, pleasurable feeling, and neutral feeling. And he compared these to a water bubble, something that just bursts up. You know, feeling's always changing. The third thing he said is perception. Perception, as you know, is one of those things that uh, is always on the move. We have different ways of looking at the world to other people. They have different ways of looking at the same world as us. He said that perceptions are like a mirage. So we can't rely upon them. The fourth volition or sankara, these are the, the things that we uh, use to create activities, will in the mind and such. He said that this was subs insubstantial, like a, the inside of a banana tree. There's no heartwood to a banana tree. It's just uh, a, a wrapped um, bark over and over again. There's no heartwood, there's no depth, there's nothing there solid that we can hold on to. And the fifth thing, consciousness, he said, is like a conjurer's trick. So these five things, are pretty much the way we'd, we'd usually think of ourselves. You know, that I am this body. I am these feelings. My perceptions are the one true perceptions to be found in the world. My uh, volition, the will that I exert in the world, this is mine. It comes from me. I own it. And our consciousness, we think, oh, this is, this is me. This is who I am. So these are the kind of who am I, what am I, what am I doing here questions that people want to investigate when they come to a spiritual path like Buddhism. And the Buddha said that these five things are actually not you. They are changing. They are impermanent. They cannot be regarded as permanent, you. They cannot be regarded as yourself. And so the first one, form, has a basis underneath that, which is these four properties that I mentioned before. <coughs> Earth, water, heat, and wind. So if we look at these four properties, we're looking at our self, our version of self, investigating this false sense of self that we hold 
in the five candors. And if we look at the five candors, we're looking at suffering. What is suffering in our life? This is the first noble truth. And if we're looking at the first noble truth, we're looking at right view. So this is the purpose in doing a meditation on the four elements, the four properties, is to correct our view. It's very important if we have the correct view, then our mind is straight, then we can be guaranteed that the things that we see and the things that we do based on right view are upright and are in line with the Dhamma. If that view is wrong, then it can be a challenging and deluded um, spiritual practice. So that's why we're practicing this um, four elements meditation. The good thing about looking at our form, looking at our version of ourself, is that we can start to uh, unravel this very strong sense of self that causes us so many problems in our life. And in the Datu Vibhanga Sutta, Sariputta points out that by unraveling this strong sense of self, it's a, there's a freedom so that we can endure things like insults, psychological attacks, you know, people hassling us, calling us names, and even physical assaults, he says, because we no longer have a strong belief in this sense of self. We start to unravel that. And when we unravel that, we're starting to uh, get closer and closer towards right view, closer and closer towards the knowledge that the Buddha had, which was his enlightenment. So that's like a very brief um, introduction to the practice tonight. I'm going to guide you through it. We're going to look at these four different elements individually, and we're going to examine them internally, that is within ourself, externally, seeing that they occur outside of ourself, internally and externally, how they intermix and exchange. We're going to look at them as impermanent, uh, not self, and changing, and we're going to see that they are uh, originating and disappearing within us as well. So this is the standard uh, practice. I'm going to make it a bit shorter um, a bit, uh, for tonight, just because we don't have forever. So let's take a comfortable posture. And I always like to start off just by taking my shoulders up to my ears and then dropping them down behind, just opening up the chest. Gently tilting the chin forward and relaxing the whole body. Letting go of all the busyness, all the activity of your day. Relaxing the whole body. <clears throat> and not worrying, not planning, not thinking about the future. Just being here now present, aware, and relaxed. Scanning the body, releasing any tension, letting go of any tightness, Allowing the body to be comfortable and at ease.
And when the body is relaxed, (coughs) the mind naturally becoming calm and peaceful. When we're calm and peaceful, mindfulness naturally appears. And so we use this mindfulness to investigate We begin by investigating the property of earth within the body. This earth property has the characteristics of hardness. Looking for hardness within the body, the bones, the fingernails. teeth, anywhere in the body that is hard, this is the earth element, the earth property. See if you can discern something hard within the body, knowing this is the earth element. The earth element also has the characteristic of softness. Softness like the hairs on the top of your ears, softness in the skin, anywhere you see softness or hardness, this is the earth element. The earth element is also rough and smooth. The ridges of the fingernails, the heels, this roughness is also the earth element. The roof of the mouth, this smoothness is also the earth element, the smoothness of the eyeballs, the lips, the insides of the mouth. And there is also the characteristic of heaviness feeling 
the heaviness of sitting on the buttocks. The heaviness in the shoulders or the head. There is this heaviness and there is lightness. The eyelashes, little hairs on the body, all of these characteristics, hardness, smoothness, lightness, heaviness, rough and smooth are characteristics of the earth, property in our bodies. So keep seeing these characteristics, knowing them to be the earth property. Keep looking inside your own body Just as we know this earth element internally, so too we understand other people also have this earth element inside them. And the world around us contains the earth element, this earth property. And so we contemplate externally We can see the earth element all around us. The dirt, the rocks, the fields, trees. This is all the earth element. All of the earth element internal to our bodies comes from the external earth element. The food that we eat, grown in the soil, taken into our bodies, <coughs> borrowed from the outside, only for a short time. Soon, that food comes out, how can it be said that this is me, that this is mine? This is impermanent, changing, and not self. So keep thinking in this way, internally, externally, both internal and external. This is not me, this is not mine, 
This is not myself. In the same way, there is the liquid property inside our body. We see the liquid in the tears, saliva, urine, sweat. It has the characteristic of flowing and cohesion. Our body mostly made up of water. We have no control over this liquid element. get sweaty, we dribble, <coughs> we need to urinate. So little control. How can we grasp at this and think of it as ourself? And we see externally this liquid element in the rain, rivers, the sea. All the liquid in our bodies is completely dependent on the external element of liquid. We are dependent on that liquid. Without water, we will die. We sweat cry. This is always changing, impermanent. This is not self. And at the end of our life, when we die, our body returns to the earth, the water element leaks out of the body and we dry up. This liquid element is not me, it is not mine, it is not myself. There is this heat element, this heat property inside our body. The temperature of our body, the digestive system. This heat element has the characteristic of heating and cooling of transforming in the way we transform our food into fuel. It's always changing. We can't control it. We get hot. Our hands get cold.
we get fevers, we get cold in winter time, always changing beyond our control. Why then do we grasp at this as sense of self? All of this heat inside us comes from the external heat element. We borrow it only for a little while. And this external heat comes entirely from the sun. Causing the day and night, change of seasons, keeping us alive and warm. This is not me, this is not mine. This is not myself. And at the end of our life, when it's time to pass on, this heat element gradually fades from our body as we become cool, then cold. And there is this wind property inside our bodies. This is the moving, pushing of the breath coming in. The support like a balloon of the lungs. This pushing is the blood rushing through our veins. This wind is all the burping, all the farting. This is the wind element. And we see externally the atmosphere, the wind, cyclones, hurricanes, the breeze brushing against our face. This is the air that we breathe. And at the end of our life, we'll take one last breath in and one last breath out. And we won't breathe in again. We borrow this breath. It is not ours. It is not me. It is not mine. This is not myself.
So for the next few minutes, contemplating in this way any of the elements, properties, internal, external, see them clearly as borrowed, as not self. And as we come to the end of this short practice, reflecting, how do you feel now? <coughs> how do you see yourself now? Has your perspective changed? And if so, why? And then gently relaxing your awareness. Coming back to the room, arising from the meditation and opening your eyes. So you can see how a teaching like this uh, investigation of these four properties can have profound uh, in impacts on the way that you view yourself. So I express some gratitude to the Buddha for, for teaching it because he is the original good friend who helps us sort out our problems. The, the Buddha is called a Kalyanamita. Have you heard this term before? It means a beautiful friend. And, and the Buddha is this original beautiful friend because he shows us a perspective that perhaps we had not thought of ourselves. The Buddha's perspective on things is vast. He taught about uh, these three knowledges that he had at enlightenment. And these are... Uh, these are a way of looking at, at things that perhaps we cannot see being mere worldlings. He saw that uh, not only is there this thing called rebirth, but that it goes on and on and on. Past lives, back, back, back to beginningless time. He said there is no discernible beginning to these past lives. 
one of the things I like about Buddhism is that, you know, it really puts things into perspective. So you think you've got problems in this life. We don't even know. You know, the big problem the Buddha says was, you don't just have this life, but you have these many, many lives where you've been wandering around in samsara, repeating these same mistakes, these same problems, over and over and over again. So instead of this very narrow view that we have of our own life, our own problems, the Buddha sees and he looks, okay, you've got much, much vaster scale of uh, past lives. And this is the real crux of the Buddha's teachings, that there is a real reason for us to try to escape the suffering that we have in this life, but not just in this life, but forever. And this is what the Buddha accomplished through his enlightenment, this extinguishment, Nibbana. So the Buddha gives us his perspective. This is what we want from a spiritual practice. He taught another sutta, which he uses a metaphor for this, which is the metaphor of a mountain. So there's some two friends, two friends who are walking in the, in the jungle, and all they can see all around them are trees and grass and uh, whatever else is in a jungle. And then one of them sees a mountain and climbs up to the top. And it, it sounds like it's a big mountain, but they seem to be able to communicate, you know, from up the top of the mountain to the bottom of the mountain somehow. And so the bottom person is saying, what do you see up there? And the person at the top's like, what? <laughs> and then shouts down, well, I can see this incredible view. I can see royal parks and meadows. I can see buildings and cities. I can see all the way to the horizon. And the person down below is going, I don't believe you. How can that be? I don't believe you at all. It's impossible. And so the person comes all the way down the mountain, takes the person up to the top of the mountain, and then they look and they see this view together. So this is a metaphor for the spiritual path. This is a metaphor for the perspective that the Buddha had as a Kalyanamitta, as a, a spiritual friend, being able to show other people a more vast experience of life than they could have imagined. So when it comes to the Buddha's teaching, some people might say, oh, I don't know about this rebirth thing. I don't know about um, karma. But uh, as Buddhists, we kind of have some faith in, in the Buddha's teaching, knowing that he had a, a more profound view of reality than we do. And so perhaps you can see by analogy that it is possible that there is something more vast than just our own experience. We're limited by our ignorance, delusion, our lack of knowledge. And so the Buddha, who we believe is perfected in these things, was able to see further than what we could. And so you can understand this from this image of the mountain. So if you have that view, if you have that perspective, it radically changes the way you perceive the problems that we have in our own lives. So another story from the suttas about the Buddha coming into contact with King Pasenadi, who was an uh, important king at the time of the Buddha. King Pasenadi was very busy with all his kingly affairs of state, probably a little bit stressed out, probably a little bit panicked about this or that, probably a little bit worried about this or that. And so the Buddha says, how are you? What's going on? And he's like, oh, I'm just really busy with the affairs of the world. And the Buddha says, oh, okay. So what would you do if I told you that there was this mountain coming towards you from the north? And he's like, ooh, that doesn't sound good. And the Buddha, Buddha says, and a mountain, a huge mountain, rolling towards you, coming from the east, crushing everything in its path. And from the south, a huge mountain. And from the west, these huge mountains coming to crush you, kind of like a big garbage compactor. What would you do, King Persenity? the Buddha asks. And the king says, well, if that was the case, <laughs> what I would do is I would practice the Dhamma. I would practice good conduct. I would do good deeds. 
And so this analogy is for us to understand as the problems of our world, our life, these are quite small. The Buddha says, this mountain, these mountains, this is old age, sickness and death coming for you. What are you going to do? Here's the king worried about his affairs of state, worried about his wives, his jewels, his money, his lands. And yet, perhaps where he should be looking is to see that old age, sickness and death are coming for him. So knowing this, how does that change your view? We all know that old age, sickness and death are coming for us, and yet we kind of put it outside of our mind. Our culture, our society doesn't encourage us to look at these things and actively hides them from us. So although we know that they're coming, it doesn't affect the way that we behave. But the Buddhists, seeing the effect of our behavior, seeing this big picture, was very concerned with how we behaved as people, as humans, to each other, to ourselves. And that's why he, he was concerned about the king and his priorities. So this sort of kind of gives us a little bit of insight into the problems, the real problems that we face that put our usual life into perspective and gives us a solution as to how we should behave, investigate the Dharma, understand the teachings, practice good behavior, don't uh, kill, don't steal, don't sexually abuse people, don't lie, and don't, uh, don't intoxicate yourself so that you can't see the truth. So this is where the Buddha encourages us to put our, our efforts in these activities. So this is what we do as Buddhists. We understand, we reflect on these mountains rushing towards us, and we look at our own behavior and encourage others to also behave well. There's a story also of the Venerable Ratapala, who was a very ardent young monk. He wanted to become a monk and his parents wouldn't let him because they were very wealthy. And he had several wives. They didn't want him to leave. But he saw something in the spiritual path, saw something. Once he saw it, he couldn't unsee it. So he was really determined to become a monk. So he went on a hunger strike and he kind of threw himself down on the ground and he wouldn't get up until his parents said yes. He talked to a king, King Koravia, and it's interesting to think that the, the Buddhist monks at the time, they had access to these uh, leaders, these, uh, they had access to kings, and they were advising these kings on, on how to conduct themselves. And he was talking to this king, saying that there are these four things the Buddha has taught about the world. And the king, being a very attentive learner, says, oh yes, tell me these four things. And the first thing says Ratapala to the king, this world is unstable, it's swept away. Everything in this world is swept away. And the king says, oh yes, very good, very good. What do you mean? And Ratapala says, well, when you were young, did you used to ride an elephant? Oh yes, I rode the royal elephant. I was very strong. I was very brave. And Ratapala says, but now you're old. Do you used to ride an elephant? Oh no, now I'm old. My body's so weak. I go to put my leg there and it goes over there. I can barely walk, let alone ride an elephant. And Ratapala says, in this way, our life is swept away so quickly carried away. There's nothing we can do to prevent it from changing from old age. There's nothing we can do at all. So this is a, a, the first thing that Ratapala tells the king. The second thing he says is that there's no protection, no shelter. And the king says, oh yes, very good. What do you mean? And Ratapala says, well, when you're sick, can you share that suffering that you have, that illness, that pain with others? Can they take it away from you? And Ratapala, and the king says, no, no, I can't. It's my burden to bear. That's my sickness, my pain. I can't share it with anyone. In the same way, he said, no one can protect you in this life. 
the suffering that you have is the suffering that you bear alone. And the king, probably getting a bit depressed by now, says, well, what was the third thing? <laughs> I, I, I have to admit I'm having trouble remembering the third thing. There is no owner. There is no owner in this life. And this he was talking about, saying all this wealth that you've hoarded, all these property, all of these titles, all of your wives, all of these things do not belong to you. And the king, of course, is like, what? When you die, he says, you have to leave them all behind. You have to be separated from these things. There's nothing you can do to hold on to them. You'll have to leave them. You don't own anything in this world. And the king asks, well, what's the, what's the fourth thing then? I swept away. What have we got so far? Impermanent. Yeah, thank you. Good. Impermanent. Yep. Wealth. Yep. Well, um, protection. Yep. Owner. Owner. Health. Wealth. <laughs> Health. Wealth. Oh. oh, huh? Oh, I can't. I can't remember the fourth one. Ah, oh, it's gonna it's gonna worry me all night now. You were looking in the phone, or anyway, well, I'll come back to. I remember in a little while. Uh, but the point being that these things, uh, health, wealth, um, success, all of these things are things that we cling to in this life, things that we put our priorities on, things that we uh, pay attention to. But the real problems are the ones that we don't pay attention to, that these, that these things are going to come and get us, not health, but death, sickness. These things are going to take us away from those things that we uh, love and hold. So... It's very important for us, if we're going to maintain a spiritual perspective, to not be so easily seduced by these things. Time is an important element here. The brevity of life is very important for us to consider. It's so easy in our culture to think that we're going to live forever. There's an, another story about Araka, who was a sage who lived Long, 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 long time ago, the Buddha talks about uh, this sage who gave these beautiful images to us about the brevity of life. The first image he uses is the image of, it's quite a cliche almost now in Buddha circles, the uh, dew on a blade of grass. The sun comes, quickly dries up that dew. This is how quick our life goes. Just like that, and it's over. He said it was like a water bubble that just plops in the rain. A line drawn in the water that, as soon as it's drawn, disappears. He says it's like a fast-flowing stream. You can't hold on to it, just flowing down, no escape. He said it's like a glob of spit something spat out. That is our life. Just like that, and it's gone. He said that it was like being a little bit of meat thrown into a hot pan. As soon as that little bit of meat touches that hot pan, it fizzles and is gone. He said it is like a cow being led to slaughter every step bringing it closer and closer to death. And you think, whew, this is pretty heavy stuff. But when do we think about death? If we did think about death, wouldn't our life be different? If we contemplated this fact that we could die at any moment, wouldn't our life be different? Wouldn't we live differently if this was your last night on earth? 
Are you going to be okay leaving behind all these things that you value? Do they even matter so much when faced with death? The Buddha said in this teaching of Araka that these people at the time of, of this, this sage, they lived for an immeasurably long time, 60,000 years they lived. This is just a story. But even so, Araka, that sage, he told his followers, wake up, you're going to die. How will you live your life? 60,000 years is a long time. Our life is very short. How much more then should we think about how we're living our life? How short our life will be? I like this vast time scale that the Buddha gives us. He talks in big terms, vast, vast time scales that make us feel so small, so insignificant. He tells another story about a mountain that lasts, uh, he says, how long is an eon? An eon is a vast period of time. How long is an eon, he says? Well, imagine a great big mountain and a soft, fine cloth. Every 100 years, someone comes along and strokes the mountain with that cloth. The amount of time that an eon lasts is the time that that soft cloth erodes that mountain once every hundred years touched. It lasts a very long time. Even if you don't believe in this eon business, even if you don't believe in this mountain thing, science uh, talks about something like deep time. This idea that the, the universe is billions and billions and billions of years old. Sometimes it's quite hard for us to conceptualize what a vast sense of time, a vast scale of the universe is like. But I did read something recently saying that uh, one million seconds, one million seconds is 11 days. One billion seconds is 37 and a half years. So it's a big shift. So if you can imagine something billions of years old, many billions of years old, it's a very, very, very long time. The reason the Buddha tells us about this is because when he looked at his moment of enlightenment and saw this never-ending chain of rebirth, back, 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 he says, you have been wandering around, samsara, wandering and wandering from life to life, for many eons. Over and over again you've been born, over and over again you've died. You've done this enough time to become disillusioned with life, disillusioned with problems, disenchanted, enough to turn away, to try to become liberated, to try to get enlightened. He says, these problems that you have in your life, these tears that you shed, how many tears have you shed in all of your lifetimes? Tears that you've shed are more than the oceans of the world. Even if you don't believe in past lives, you might get a sense of how important it is to have some perspective, a perspective informed by experience. So the Buddha's experience was that there's this vast uh, sequence of past lives, your own experience in this life, you've grown up, you know that as an adult, your experience changes the way that you looked at the world. As a young child growing up, you had a different perspective to what you have now as an adult. I remember being so stressed about the year 10 exams. Can you imagine? I thought it was make or break, the end of my life, you know, or the beginning, whichever way it went. I was so tight, so stressed and worried. But now, imagine, 
imagine talking to a year 10 student now. What would I say to them? Relax. Doesn't even matter. <laughs> this is the benefit of a vast view, a broad perspective, like what the Buddha has. This is how we can view our own life, uh, even if we're not sure about past lives. And so I'm trying to view him now a little bit away from the horror of, of death and the certainty that it will bring us and to a little bit more practical. So you know that we've got all of these, these um, problems that occur in our life, like um, uh, loss of reputation, um, loss of possessions, loss of age, uh, sorry, loss of bodily function, um, we've got uh, good things too that come like praise or gains and these are the, the lokadamas, the eight lokadamas that the Buddha talks about, gains and loss, praise and blame um, uh, fame and disgrace and pleasure and pain so he calls these the lokadamas. Some people call them the worldly winds. These are the things that kind of buffet the world, that drive uh, change in our lives. So you can see how he's pointing here these pairs of opposites. Uh, you just need to think about someone like Rolf Harris or uh, what's the latest one? Uh, Jeffrey Rush? Uh, so many, so many, yeah. So, so they, they were famous and now they're disgraced. See how it changes? You get a new phone, and you drop it, lost, gain and loss, yeah? This is the way it works. You get praised for doing something. I was thinking that this about my, my little niece, who's when she was getting toilet trained, was constantly praised for going to the toilet. Very good girl, very good girl. And I was getting no praise at all. <laughs> So these things change. Uh, pleasure and pain, of course, being the things that really drive us, these two extremes, pleasure, pain. We spend our entire life trying to avoid pain, our entire life trying to get pleasure. But when the Buddha talked about these lokadamas, these eight worldly conditions, he was saying, these things are not stable. These things change. These things are impermanent. They're not, uh, they're not you. So when we have praise, we kind of think, yes, I'm a good person. When that praise turns to blame, are we still a good person? Or are we a blameworthy person? Or are we both a praiseworthy person and a blameworthy person, or neither a blameworthy person nor a praiseworthy person? Where are we in this? It's all changing. How can we cling to these things? How can we define ourselves by our uh, status, our homes, our collections, our cars, if those things are going to change? Who are we without these things? So the Buddha said, these eight worldly conditions, they're experienced by everyone, both the wise people, the Arya, Savakas, the people who've had a glimpse of the Four Noble Truths, a glimpse of enlightenment, these people experience these things too, just as we ordinary, mundane, worldly humans do. What's the difference then, he asks? And the difference is just one of perspective. They, the wise people, when they see these things happening in their life, they don't get attached, they don't get intoxicated, they don't obsess over these things. Ah, look, people are giving me things, wonderful presents. I'm not going to get attached to that. Ah, look, people are stealing from me. Whatever, it's okay. The, the difference is just one of perspective, not getting involved, not becoming infatuated, not defining oneself by these different things, praise, blame, fame, disgrace, pleasure, pain, gains, loss. These things just come and go. And so uh, this is the difference. The, the main point I'm trying to make is that it's one of view, of perspective. 
So if we see in a certain way we become intoxicated, we have that view that is just here, that, like that, that ball right in front of our face. We can't see anything else. All these people chasing um, fame on Instagram and Facebook, you know, or chasing money, chasing uh, success and wealth. It's just here, so tight, so infatuated. You can't see anything beyond that. However, the wise person knows that it's impermanent, not self, subject to change, and therefore isn't infatuated. And so this is the, this, the kind of trick the Buddha is trying to get us to look at with something like that meditation that we did before. Really question the sense of self really question our understanding of who we think we are. So if you want some practical advice for how we can keep things in perspective, do meditation practices like the four elements. Uh, practice the five frequent recollections. These are, I am subject to old age. I am subject to sickness. I am subject to death. Everything that is uh, dear to me will have to pass away. I'll have to leave it behind. And the, the law of karma, all of the actions that I do have an effect. So there's nothing that we can do about those first um, four things. We can't do anything about old age, sickness, death. We can't do anything about the separation that comes from the things that we like. We can do something about our actions. And when we do good actions, we provide ourselves with a good ground, a vast ground of good actions, so that when change happens in our life, when uncertainty hits us, when we get gains or loss, when we have praise or blame, if things go wrong in our lives, if problems appear, we have this vast ground of goodness to comfort us, knowing that we are good people, that we've done good. So a small bit of salt in a small glass of water will still make that glass of water undrinkable, tastes very salty. But a small amount of salt, the same amount of salt in a vast river doesn't affect the flavor of the water at all. In the same way, if the mountains of old age, sickness and death are coming to crush us, what else is there to do but do good practices? <coughs> be kind, be gentle, don't yell at people, don't hurt them, don't steal from people, don't kill. Do good practices so that the actions that we practice will have good results, both here and now in this life and for also for future lives. So this is the five, uh, the five frequent recollections that we can do and that karma being the important one. And I'll just finish by saying, even a little bit of meditation, a little bit of awareness of the breath, becoming calm, becoming peaceful, establishes that sense of perspective for troubles that we have in our world. So if you practice a little bit of meditation every day, calmness, quietness, peace, this builds and builds and builds and becomes a buffer zone to any problems that we have. So any difficulties that we face, all look smaller when we have this perspective that meditation brings. And also getting into nature, seeing a vast view, looking up at the stars, purposefully feeling insignificant, puts these things into perspective for us too. So this is a short talk on how we can change our perspective. And I offer it to you hoping that it may be confronting, but of some benefit to you here, now, or in the future. So thank you for listening. Are there any questions? I frightened them. You should have come last week for the sunshine meditation. So we'll, um, uh, okay. Okay.
yeah, you should enjoy the things that you have. But the wisdom really is the is the shift in perspective. So I was speaking to a friend yesterday who um, is an old friend of mine. And I was saying how now when I travel, I just I just take my bowl and my bag. So that's all I have. So very few possessions, very light. And she was like, why, why don't you have stuff? And I'm like, oh, you know, it's, it's such a burden. And she was like, she, she went like this. She went, oh. <laughs> like that I'm flagellating myself that, you know, this is all about suffering. And I was like, I remember you having to move house. You had to sell your house because you couldn't afford to pay it. All of your beautiful furniture, all of your beautiful artwork you had to get rid of because you had to go to a smaller house that you couldn't fit everything in. And that was a burden. All of these things for her were a burden. And she couldn't hang on to them. She really suffered. I remember her at the time, so stressed out having to part with the things that she had and not wanting to, this attachment. It really made her very unwell, actually, unhappy and unwell. And so even in that small moment where she had to move house, she was full of suffering because of the attachment that she had to these things. How much more then at the end of our own lives will we suffer when we have to leave? You have probably heard stories about people who on their deathbed are worried about who's going to feed the cat or are worried about such and such um, not sweeping the yard. You know, where are our priorities here? So if we continue to put up our sense of uh, priorities on these um, material things, on wealth status, we're not looking at the, the big picture. So if we, if we have a limited view of those things, then it's going to cause us a lot of distress. But if we have a larger view, we see it in context. You know, many lifetimes we've done this, many lifetimes we've died. Yet when we talk about death in our culture, people freak out. People get, they look at you kind of like, um, like a deer in the headlights, like, don't talk about that. That's the last thing I want to think about, you know, and we, we, we brush it aside. So it's more important from a Buddhist point of view to have this sense of truth, of a sense of reality and to not become intoxicated by the things that stand in the way of seeing that clearly. So if we spend all our time cultivating a sense of self that revolves around our status, our belongings, our postal address, all of these things, then they're just more things that we're going to have to give up. It's, it is pretty heavy, isn't it, for Wednesday night? <laughs> Thank you for the time to chew on it. Yeah, do have a good chew. <laughs> One more question. I'm here to Buddhism, and um, when you were doing the meditation, you equated a body with the fire. I just wondered what would you equate our thoughts and our mind and our conscience to? In the same way that the version that we have of ourself is in terms of our body, is um, a, a wrong version. So our body doesn't exist the way we think it does. You know, we know that our body comes from DNA. We know that it's a product of the, the food that we put in, our, our parents, our environment, all of these things. So we know if we kind of look carefully like a scientist, we can kind of break it down and we can see actually, you know, there isn't really anything there that is a single permanent stable self. It's much harder though to see that the same is true of the mind, that our mind is actually a product of our parents, our conditioning, our society, our education. There isn't actually much a, of originality in us. We're pretty predictable in that we are, you know, um, we are a product of these conditions. So it is difficult to see that our mind changes, but we know that our mind is not the same as it was when we were babies. We know that when we receive new information, sometimes we change our view. We know that our perception is uh, 
and our memories are incredibly flawed, that when we remember our sense of self, we're actually inventing it anew, that we, we don't have this permanent, stable entity. Every morning we wake up and we just think because we wake up in the same body, in the same bed, that that is us. But actually the, the Buddha says that this is a, a wrong view. It doesn't mean to say that we don't have this body, that we don't have this mind, but it doesn't exist for us in the same way that we think of it as. So in terms of a broadness of view, in terms of a perspective, those five candors, the form, this body, the perceptions, sorry, the feelings that we have, the perceptions, the volitions that we have and the conscious that we have, the Buddha compared this to a dog chained to a stake. So what the dog does is walk round and round and round and round and eventually just settles down. So this is in the same way our sense of self revolves around and round and round these five candors, these five clinging aggregates that we mistake for ourself. And that dog just sees that view. That's all the dog sees, walking round and round and round. That's all the dog can see. However, the Buddha is like a hound unchained. And so he saw that if uh, we weren't chained to this pole, if we weren't chained to these uh, deluded views of self, then our sense of self is much broader, much greater, far more vast. And this is the insight that he had. And this is the wisdom that he saw in that uh, by recognizing that our past lives condition this future life and our, past, our, pre, our present actions condition the future actions, that our sense of consciousness is much bigger than what we perceive it as in this one narrow view of ourself and our life.